This is our second lecture on one-dimensional finite difference time domain. In this lecture, we will review briefly what happened last time and uh, just to start the conversation. We formulated the basic update equations for a one-dimensional finite difference time domain. And we saw that essentially we're updating the E field from the curl of H and updating the H field from the curl of E. And we're bouncing back and forth, E, H, E, H, E, H, E, H, E, H. Uh, but that's useless right now because everything starts at zero, everything stays at zero, that's a good first step. But we need to add some things to this to actually start simulating something. And the second part of this lecture is the sequence of code development. Now we can imagine to ourselves, okay, we want to build in a device, we want to incorporate a source, we want to record what's happening, transmission reflection maybe, we want to absorb outgoing waves, maybe we want to do some Fourier transforms. We would never ever dream up all these features, sit down, write an entire code that does all these things, and then when we're done, hit run for the very first time. That is horrible programming practice. Remember, we're gonna do this like Onion, and we'll start off with this basic engine, which we discussed last time. We'll actually implement that and run it, make sure nothing happens. And then slowly, we're going to add features to this. And it's so important, I animated each individual step. We'll talk about that, and then we'll get into the details of what's involved with each step. But you'll definitely want to look at your code and run it at each of these steps and make sure everything's correct at each of those steps because if you put in everything and it suddenly didn't work, there's many, many more places where the problem could be. Whereas if you build it in layers and make sure you're building on something that you know is correct, that isolates where the new problems can come in. So then in implementation, one of the first things we'll do is talk about boundary conditions. We want to absorb a wave that hits a boundary. We want it to just disappear and not reflect off the boundary. We want to talk about grid resolution. How big do we need to make those cells? There's a stability condition. This defines our time step. Uh, we'll talk more about the boundary condition. We'll talk about how to inject a source. Then we need to know how long we run the simulation. Then based on all this, we're going to revise our, our finite difference time domain algorithm. And now we're going to end up with something where we can actually watch waves bounce back and forth. The next lecture will discover how to learn things from your model, calculate how much gets reflected, how much gets transmitted, and stuff like that. So last time we learned that real functions have an infinite amount of information with them. We can't do that on a computer, so we have to divide space up into discrete cells. And even within one of those cells, there's an infinite amount of information. We really can only store our function values at infinitely small points within each one of those cells. So if we're going to visualize, let's say, our electric field stored on a grid, this on the far right is the most accurate picture of that. We then said that it's advantageous to stagger the field components on the grid. So we adopted a Yi grid. And this gave us several advantages. The divergence equations were naturally satisfied. The physical boundary conditions are naturally satisfied. And it's a very elegant way to write the finite difference equations. We then reduced the E grid down to 2D and 1D. Right now we're talking about a 1D grid. Then we formulated update equations. First, we normalized the magnetic field so that the electric and magnetic fields were the same order of magnitude. We assumed that we had linear, isotropic, non-dispersive materials. And in fact, it's probably incorrect to say isotropic. We assumed diagonally anisotropic materials. And so our two vector curl equations expanded into this set of six coupled partial differential equations. Then we went one by one, we looked at the E grid, we looked at our partial differential equation, and we approximated the derivatives using finite differences. And we ended up here. Then we said for one dimensional problems, we're really looking at infinite slabs of material that go off to infinity in the X and Y directions, but have finite thicknesses in the Z direction. Well, if they are of infinite extent and they're uniform slabs and don't change in the x and y directions, and we also restrict propagation to be just along the z-axis, 
any derivative we take in the x or y direction has to be zero. So then we can go back into our Maxwell's equations, delete all the derivatives where there's an x or y derivative, set them to zero, and we found that Maxwell's equations not only simplify, but decouple into two independent modes. And for isotropic materials, we really would get the same answer no matter which one we modeled it. We went with the, the EY HX mode. From there, we solved our two remaining finite difference equations for the field values at the future time steps. And we called those our update equations. We had some coefficients that collected in the constants that we'll calculate ahead of time. We called those our update coefficients. And then we wrote a block diagram where first thing we would do is calculate our update coefficients. Then we'll initialize our fields to zero. Then we enter the main finite difference time delaying loop where we calculate E from H, H from E, E, H, E, H, E, H, and this just iterates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And not only that, but every time we update H from E, we actually have to iterate this over Z. So we've set up a loop over all of our Z points in our 1D grid and do this update equation for each point. Then we've updated H, and we do the same thing again, a whole other loop, updating E from H. So we have really three loops happening here. We have the outer time loop, and then in each of the update equations, we have two loops over Z. Okay, now we're ready to move on. Before we get into the theory and the implementation of all these, let's see what our finite difference time to make code will look like at each step. We have animations of this. So here's our first step where we've implemented just the basic finite difference time domain equations and we'll run this. So we see we're iterating and we're updating E from H, H from E, E from H, H from E. We're going back and forth, E, H, E, H, E, H, E, H, E, H. And we're doing this over 2,000 iterations. Notice nothing's happening. We initialized all our fields to zero so when we calculate the curl of H, that is zero. So we're adding zero to update E, so E stays at zero, and this just goes on. So nothing happens. This is a great check to do when you absolutely have to do this. Suppose numbers appeared. Clearly something's wrong with your code. So this is a sort of a self-check. And that's the first step, the basic FDTD algorithm, and nothing should happen here. Then we're gonna learn how to add a very simple soft source. It's not very practical, and we need a little bit more sophisticated source that we'll get to later, but we need some way to inject energy. And we'll, we'll do what's called a soft source. So we're iterating, and suddenly you'll see something happen at the middle of the grid. We're essentially adding a little impulse function as a function of time. And now when we're updating EH, 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 we can see these waves travel across the grid. And if we don't do anything about it, they're just going to bounce off of the boundaries and then come back in. And so essentially what would happen, these pulses that we're looking at, they're gonna bounce back and forth for as long as we run this simulation. But that is the second step. We've implemented a source, we let it run, we see that those pulses are not growing or shrinking in time, they're not exploding, everything's nice and stable. That's a good indication that our basic update equations are correct. So that was step two. Remember, we do need a little bit more sophisticated source. This one isn't that useful yet. Next step, we would like those pulses to hit the boundaries but appear as if they just go off to infinity. So watch what happens here when the pulses hit. They no longer reflect, they just keep going kind of like they're going off to infinity. But in fact they're not, we're not processing any numbers outside of the grid. They just, we're handling the, the grid boundaries in some way that the waves appear to go off. And for a one dimensional finite difference time domain, we can actually use something called a perfect boundary condition. When we go to higher dimensions, two and three dimensions, that perfect boundary condition is, is no longer usually possible. So that was step three, adding those, those absorbing boundary conditions. Step four, this is where we'll adopt a more sophisticated source. Notice when we injected a pulse before, the pulse went in both directions, and so we're not really controlling things too well. 
we're going to implement something called a total field scatter field source. And essentially think of this as a one-way source. It launches a wave in one direction, this way left to right. Now what would happen is if something reflected, the pulse would travel from right to left then, but then it'd be able to pass through where we injected the source. It would be transparent to that. So in fact, if we were to the left of that total field scatter field source, any fields we see have to be reflected from whatever it is we're modeling. And that'll be very useful later when we're calculating reflection because we don't want to confuse it with the source. Next thing we want to do is move where we inject the source. It's not very useful to put it right in the middle of our grid. In fact, we'd like it all the way over to the left so we can use the full grid to model devices. The other thing we want to do is record those pulses as they leave the grid. And since we excite the problem with a pulse, and we record the pulse at either end, we're recording the impulse response of whatever our device is. And if we Fourier transform that impulse response, then we get reflectance and transmittance as a function of frequency. So we'll watch this. We're, we moved our total field scatter field source off to the left. It propagates from left to right. And you'll notice when it crosses the right-hand boundary, that will get recorded as transmitted field. Oh, and by the way, the blue line's the electric field, the red line's the reflected field. Okay, so it passed, and what we see is the reflection number, that's the red line, is zero, zero reflectance. Well, that makes sense. There was nothing for it to reflect off of. Transmission was one, or 100% all the way across. So. We've moved our source so that we can model something in the middle, and we added the ability to calculate transmission and reflection. That was our next step. Now, this is the complete algorithm after we do step six. We add our device. So we have some crazy device in here. Let's start simulating it. And we see we launch a pulse. It hits that device. It reflects some, and we see the the reflection curve come up a little bit, look a little bit crazy. We see some ringing inside that device and our pulses bounce back and forth. Now what we're looking at in the transmittance and reflectance plot is three different lines. The red line is total reflectance, the blue line is total transmittance, and in an ideal world if we add those two curves we should get 100 percent. That's conservation of energy. The dashed black line is the conservation. And notice at first how inaccurate that was. That's because there's energy still bouncing back and forth inside our device. We have to keep running our simulation until that leaves. And then we can record it as either transmission or reflection. And as that energy begins to leave, that conservation of, of energy line flattens out at 100%. So we can tell by how flat that is how close to being finished this simulation we are. So by the time we get to, in this case, about 10,000 iterations, we're pretty close to flat. Maybe not perfect, but pretty close. And we could let it keep running. So in the beginning, when I mentioned finite difference time domain is not very good at modeling highly resonant devices, suppose that brick in the middle, that pulse, didn't leak out very efficiently, and it just kept bouncing back and forth, back and forth. We would have to keep running and running and running this until our conservation line flattened out. But now we have a pretty complex transmission reflection function, and we have a pretty neat device. So that's it. So we had six steps, and we literally will code and test each one along the way. So the next thing then is to discuss the details of, of what's involved with doing each one of these things. And we won't get to all of them in this lecture. In the, the electronic notes, of course, we can't see the movie, so I've summarized all these individual steps in one slide. So step one is the basic FDTD algorithm, nothing happens. Step two is just a very, very simple source. One line of code in our algorithm, we can inject energy. And since we do, didn't do anything at the boundaries yet, that pulse will keep bouncing back and forth. And hopefully it doesn't explode or disappear, because that's a sign something's wrong. Then we did something at our boundaries to let the pulse just appear as if it goes off to infinity. Then we converted our source to a one-way source using something called a total field scatter field. And that just launched a source from left to right. It did not backward propagate any part of the source. So we're controlling our source much more sophisticated.
Then we move that total field scatter field over to the way left side of the grid. That opens up the entire grid to put a device in there. And we also started calculating transmittance and reflectance. And in this case, we should get 100% transmittance, 0% reflectance. And the final step, we added a device, and that's a complete one-dimensional finite difference time domain code with a reasonable degree of sophistication. Here's a discussion on numerical boundary conditions. We previously talked about physical boundary conditions. That was the deal where our, our tangential components of the fields were continuous across the interface and something else happened with the normal components. We have another problem called numerical boundary conditions. We are writing a finite difference uh, equation for each point on the grid. However, at the extreme edges of the grid, sometimes we need a field value from outside of the grid. Well, that doesn't exist. We're not storing it. Clearly, we have to do something special here. Whatever it is we do, we're calling a numerical boundary condition, not to be confused with the physical boundary conditions. They're completely different things. One happens at the edge of a grid. The other is the behavior of the field at a material interface. So here's our two update equations. We have our update equation for H, and we have our update equation for E. Let's look at the update equation for H. Notice in this finite difference here, we're reaching to the next cell. So we might ask, what happens when this integer k is at the very last cell? We're writing this finite difference equation at the very last cell. It needs an electric field from outside of the grid. That does not exist. What do we do? How do we handle that? Well, our numerical boundary condition. So for the H field update equation, we only have a problem at the end of the grid. For the E field update equation, we're using an H field from the previous cell. So for the H field update equations, we have a problem at the first cell of the grid because H at zero position does not exist. We're not storing it and we need some way to handle this. So that's the problem. Everywhere else on the grid, these equations have no issues. It's only at the first and last cell that there's potential issues. The absolute easiest thing we can do is just say to ourselves, whatever is outside the grid is zero. We force it to zero. So our update equation would take on this form then. For all of the points in the grid except the last one, we just do our normal update equation. For that very last point, where this term does not exist, we would just set it to zero. And what we've done is we've forced the electric field to be zero at the end of the grid. Well, what do we know physically that would force an electric field to be zero? A metal. So by doing a Dirichlet boundary condition for the H field update equation, we've essentially put a perfect electric conductor at the end of the grid, and any wave that hits that will reflect just how it would reflect from a perfect electric conductor. A similar argument for the electric fields. We have our ordinary update equation for every point on the grid except the first point. At the first point, we need a, a magnetic field value from outside the grid that doesn't exist. We'll just assume it's zero for Dirichlet boundary conditions. Well, when the magnetic field is forced to zero, that's like putting a perfect magnetic conductor at the start of the grid. When a wave hits that, it will also reflect just like it would reflect from a perfect magnetic conductor. And in terms of the phase of the waves, things are a little bit different when a wave reflects off a perfect electric conductor than it does a perfect magnetic conductor. So this also introduces a little bit of asymmetry into the problem as well. But it's the easiest thing. Anything we need from outside the grid, it's zero. That's called a Dirichlet boundary condition. So how do we put this in MATLAB code if we want to do Dirichlet boundary conditions? Let's look at the H field update equations. Well, we have our ordinary update equation, and we do this for all the points on the grid except the last point. So when we set up our loop, we'll go from the first point all the way up to not quite the last point, but the second to last point. So we can do our update equation without any problems. Now we do this equation for the very last cell separately. And so h at the last cell equals h at the last cell plus our update coefficient at the last cell times zero minus ey at the last cell. So we manually put in a zero here. 
Now notice we're doing this without any if statements. We could, in principle, have this loop go from one to nz and have an if statement in here that if we're at the last cell, do this update equation, otherwise do this one. However, then we're running an if statement at each iteration. So it's a little bit faster if we don't have if statements every time. So we always handle these boundary conditions not using if statements. We just discreetly handle the boundary conditions separately. Now for the E-field update equation, we have our standard update equation that we'll want to do everywhere except the first point. So here we have a loop that goes from two instead of one all the way up to big NZ, and we do our normal update equation. We handle that first point separately. So E at the first point equals E at the first point plus our updated coefficient at the first point plus H at the first point minus zero. We've forced this, this should be H outside the grid, but we're forcing that to zero. So again, we're doing this without using any if statements. So this will be our update equations using Dirichlet boundary conditions. If we're modeling periodic devices, what ends up happening in a periodic structure is the electric and magnetic fields, the electromagnetic fields, take on the same symmetry as the structure they're in. So if we have something that's periodic, let's say every centimeter the, the device repeats, the field will also repeat every centimeter. So that means if we need a field value from outside the grid on the right, we could just reach over here to inside the grid, just to the right of that interface. And those fields should be the same if the field is also periodic. Likewise on the left, if we need a field value from outside the grid, we could just reach over here and grab one of the field values. That's called periodic boundary conditions. So to implement those, of course we still have our standard update equation that gets implemented everywhere. And for the H field, everywhere but the very last cell, that's what we handle separately. Before, for Dirichlet boundary conditions, we had a zero in here. Now what we're doing, we're reaching to the other side of the grid. This superscript here was NZ plus one, which doesn't exist. So we go all the way back over to the left side of the grid and we use the electric field at the first cell. So here we're doing a periodic boundary condition. And likewise for the electric field, we have the ordinary update at all cells across the grid except the first cell. We handle that separately. And here, we had a magnetic field from outside the grid. For Dirichlet boundary conditions, we just put in a zero. But now, instead of using H at the zero position, which doesn't exist, we'll go all the way to the right-hand side of the grid and say the H, uh, use the H value at position NZ, big NZ. So now we have periodic boundary conditions. And when we put in periodic boundary conditions, we are modeling something that is periodic. Okay, let's talk a little bit more practically and try to answer the question, how big do our cells need to be in our grid to get an accurate simulation? We need to consider two things. The first one is wavelength. If we are sweeping something over a frequency, maybe we're modeling something from one megahertz up to 100 megahertz, that upper frequency, F max, corresponds to the shortest possible wavelength. So F max corresponds to the shortest possible wavelength. The speed of light divided by F max gives us our minimum free space wavelength. Well, that shortest wavelength could be inside something that has a very high refractive index. So we search our grid for the highest possible refractive index divide that shortest free space wavelength by the maximum refractive index, and what we have is the minimum possible wavelength that our model could see. What we want to do is resolve this minimum wavelength with at least 10 cells. So we'll take this minimum wavelength, divide by an integer that's something probably like 10, and that is a first guess as to what our grid resolution would, be, would should be, based on wavelengths, so that's the sub wavelength number here. Now for devices that just have pretty low refractive index materials, that N being from 10 to 20 works pretty well. When we go to higher contrast, maybe we're going from air to something that has a dielectric constant of 20 or 30 or 40, uh, that N should be more in the, in the range of 20 to 30. Metallic structures, in my experience, uh, converge somewhere when that N is between 40 and 60. And I've seen that end number needing to be as high as 200 when I was modeling plasmonic devices.
The next thing we need to consider are feature sizes. We might have some skinny little tiny feature that we need to resolve in our model. So we need to look at that and figure out what is that minimum feature that we need to resolve. We'll call that D min. And then we need to pick how many cells we want to represent that minimum feature size by. And probably we would want at least one cell. So we pick that minimum feature, divide by an integer like one to three or four, and then we have the grid resolution based on resolving the minimum feature size. So let's say we have a structure that looks real skinny and sparse like this. If we use too few points, this is what our grid would look like. We can't even tell what that structure was. Now we go a little bit finer, eh, it's starting to look like something. And now if we set ND exactly equal to one, we start to see something that's resembling our structure. If we make it something like four, now it's looking even more realistic. So usually a number between one and four works pretty good for this. So let's illustrate this. What we're showing is a finite difference time domain grid. And it's, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 points wide. We have the time step. So this is what it looks like at time step one. And we're injecting a source here. And this will be a, a one-way source. So we're injecting a one, and this number will slowly increase and it will send numbers to the right. Over here, we are recording this value one time step later, and then over here, we're recording this value one time step later. So the value at the very far right-hand side is the value from inside the grid two time steps ago. So let's go through this sequence. At time step two, the value of our source increases a little bit, and we're starting to see some numbers move over to the right. At time step three, finally this is where we see this one appear one cell over, but two time steps later. And we'll see this pattern repeat. Any of these numbers will repeat two time cells later. So we keep injecting the source, we keep recording that field value at the edge of the grid. Time step three, source value increases a little bit, everything moves over. Time step five, now we see our three, two, one. Let's keep going and we see this propagate to the right hand side. Now, at, finally at time step 10, we have a 0.5 in the last position. So at time step 11, we'll see that recorded. Then at time step 12, we recorded the one and that 0.5 has moved over. Time step 13 and time step 14. But notice that every two time steps, this one moves over one cell every two time steps. And so we can use this information if we're recording that boundary, we can re we, we know now if we need a field value from outside the grid, it has to be this, that second recorded value. And you'll notice this entire column should be the field value immediately outside the grid. And we can use that as our boundary condition. And we do this on both sides and we have our, our perfect boundary condition. So here's a summary of what needs to happen. One, we need insurance that waves at the boundaries are only traveling outward. So as long as our source is away from the boundaries, then at least on the left-hand side of the grid, 
We're launching a one-way source from left to right. We may get a wave or something that bounces off our device. It passes through our source transparently. So when it hits the boundary, it, it, it is only traveling outward on the left-hand side of the grid. And on the right-hand side of the grid, clearly we're not intentionally launching a source from right to left at the far side. So anything at the far right-hand side of the grid we're also insured is leaving. So our total field scatter field source that we haven't really talked about yet, that is what really ensuring that anything we see at the very edges of the grid is traveling outward. But that is a requirement. The materials at the boundary have to be linear, homogeneous, isotropic, and non-dispersive for this to work. And they also need to be the same. Because when we calculated that time step, we had that refractive index in there, N sub BC for boundary condition. That has to be the same. So that is a limitation of this perfect boundary condition. And the other thing is, we have to calculate the time step exactly so that waves travel one cell in exactly two time steps. And that's what ensures this whole thing works. So how do we implement this at the Z-low boundary? So we modify our update equation at the very first cell. We need an H value from outside the grid, so we pick H3. But here's how we implement this. H3 will equal H2, then we say H2 equals H1, and then we say H1 equals H at the edge of the boundary. That ensures, after one time step, tick, two time steps, tick, that H3 is that value at the edge of the grid two time steps later, and that's what we use in our equation. Likewise, at the Z high boundary, when we're updating the magnetic field, we need an electric field from outside of the grid. But we implement it in this order. We set E3 equal to E2, E2 equal to E1, and then E1 equal to the field value at the outer edge of the grid. So at our second time step, this comes over to E2, and third time step, it comes over to E3. So in just two time steps, this E3 is the electric field. It, it was this value two time steps ago. And so that's how we do it. But we implement it in this order. If we reverse this, it won't work. So that is our perfect boundary condition. And this works very well with those conditions we stated above, which may be too limiting, but we can still model a lot of things with it. Let's talk more about sources. Usually in finite difference time domain, we excite our problem with a Gaussian pulse source. A very, very short pulse contains a lot of frequencies. So in one simulation, we can actually simulate the performance of a device over an incredibly broad band of frequencies. So this is our Gaussian pulse, and here's the equation we use to describe it. So it may have some time offset, T naught, and some duration, tau. So tau really is a, a measure of the width of the pulse. So at the one over E point, it's actually two tau wide. If we Fourier transform the basic Gaussian, we get the frequency spectrum of that. From this, we can say if we want up to some frequency B, B is related to 1 over pi tau. We could actually choose the width of our pulse to incorporate energy and frequencies up to B. So the narrower the pulse, the more frequencies that pulse will cover. There's other implications. Our model will have to run longer because our time step is shorter. But we can choose that tau parameter, the width of the pulse, based on that maximum frequency that we want to model. So that maximum frequency would be B. So here's the procedure we go to to define and design our source. We pick a maximum frequency. That's really our B. We know that that's related to the duration of the poles, 1 over pi tau. Solving this for tau, we get tau is 1 over pi F max. So I like to just calculate with this simple equation. The duration of the pulse is 0.5 divided by the maximum frequency. So usually what happens is, we will make a first guess at the time step based on the current stability condition. Then kind of like we did for the grid, we went back and we looked at minimum feature sizes and we wanted to 
we wanted to represent those with some number of cells. Here, we want to represent that Gaussian source with at least 10 to 20 time steps. So if our time step's too large, we'll make it smaller so that we do it. Now, if we use that equation that we gave for our boundary condition, this already takes all of this into account. This should be, this should satisfy everything that we're talking about here already and also our boundary condition. So in a way, we don't have to give it as much thought here. When we go to a two-dimensional simulation, we'll have to think about this again. We also need to consider the offset, the time offset of our source. So imagine we pre-calculate, we know we're gonna run our simulation for 10,000 iterations, and we pre-calculate our source over those 10,000 iterations. If we did not give our Gaussian source an offset, this is what our source would look like as a function of time. But notice right at the beginning, we are slamming right into that source. That's not a good thing to do. We don't want to do that. We want to ease into the source and ease out of it. Well, if we waited one tau, we're still sort of slamming into the source. We have this, this sharp discontinuity here. We do ease out of it pretty good. So what if we waited five or six taus? Well, at first we have all zeros, but we do ease into the source we ease out of it. So in my codes, I usually wait five to six tau's and then introduce the source. And so we, we ease in, we ease out, and everything's numerically robust that way. In finite difference time domain, there's two broad categories of sources. One is called a simple hard source. And then what we do is we pre-calculate a source, we'll call it G, and all we do is we pick a position in our grid where we want to inject the source and we just overwrite it with the source value. So whatever was there, we just get rid of and overwrite it with our source. Or we could also do this with the electric field, just overwrite whatever was at this point K with our source. This is not usually practical and we really won't use it in this class except maybe to test boundary conditions you could use this. Um, but it's talked about, but it's not useful because any wave that might get reflected from your device and heads back to your source, since we're overwriting here, it's kind of like there's a perfect electric conductor or a perfect magnetic conductor, and that wave won't pass through your source region like it was transparent, instead it will reflect from it. And that's problematic. So if we want to inject the source, but make it transparent, we need to use what's called a soft source. So here, instead of overwriting a value on the grid, we would just add to it. So h at point k will be h at point k plus whatever source value we want to overwrite. And we could do this for the magnetic field and or the electric field. So we're adding to what's on the grid. Now, this is much better because if we excite a pulse that hits our device, some of that bounces off, it can pass through our source region and then hit the boundary and just disappear forever. But the simple soft source still isn't that good because it launches energy in both directions and we're not controlling the amplitude real sophisticated. And uh, we need to modify the simple soft source and that modification will be called total field scatter field. We get into that during the next lecture. But these are the two types of sources, the broad categories that we can talk about in finite difference time domain. The soft source is definitely preferred. So here's an animation of a simple hard source. It sends energy in both directions. In this case, we're not doing anything fancy at our boundaries. We're not using the perfect boundary, so they reflect. But notice when those pulses hit that source region again, they reflect from it. We've essentially put a big metal divider in the middle of our, of our grid, and this is kind of useless. Maybe there's a use for it out there, but uh, in my opinion, this is a useless source. These will just bounce back and forth and nothing will ever transmit through the source. I'll also point out since it's here, notice there's some ringing developing here. We initially started off with a nice pretty Gaussian and you'll notice on the trailing edge of those Gaussians that there's some ringing. Uh, we'll talk about why that is in a later lecture, but the, the short answer is it's numerical dispersion. The waves in a finite difference grid um, see slightly different material properties depending on the frequency, so the frequencies travel at different speeds and you're watching the pulse essentially disperse. That's something we'll talk about later in the course.
Now let's look at the soft source. So instead of just overwriting the field values, we add to it. It starts off looking pretty much the same. We have a source that travels in, in either direction. We're bouncing off our grid, but notice what happens when the pulse hits the source region. It just passes through as if nothing's there. That's what we're looking for. That's what we want. So in this class, we will only use soft sources. We won't use the simple one. We'll use a more sophisticated one called a total field scatter field. That's the one-way source. And we also see that we're still getting this ringing. And there's ways to handle that. That ringing becomes a problem with very electrically large structures. That would not physically happen, it's just something happening on our grid. Okay, so now here's the sophisticated source when we, when we talk about this. We'll talk about this next time, but we can certainly visualize it. This is the one-way source. We're waiting about six tows before we launch it. But we launch the source. And notice it's only going one way from left to right. So that way when we're to the left of that, that interface where we injected the source, we know that the waves are only traveling outward. So the wave has bounced off the first interface and you'll notice that it'll pass transparently through the source region. Notice that the pulse inside that blob of dielectric is traveling slower, so it appears to be more compressed. And here it also looks like we're implementing the perfect boundaries, and our materials just leave nice and peacefully. So that's the total field scatter field source. This is the one that we will use to model devices. So let's visualize our arrays and, and how we would actually do this. We first have our array where we're storing our field values. So this is a function of z. Then we have some point where we're injecting a source and we may want to calculate this ahead of time over all the different iterations that we will be doing. So I have an array now over time and we'll calculate our source. So we give it a five or six tau delay. That way we ease into the source and ease out of it. But we do want to excite the impulse as close to the beginning as possible. And then at this point, we're no longer really doing anything as a source. It just keeps injecting zero. And this is where the simulation is happening. This is where that pulse is bouncing around your device and we are recording things. So the field values update coefficients are in arrays of length big NZ. That's the number of points on the grid along the Z axis. Our source is stored in a different 1D array, which is a function of time. And it's of length, I'm calling it steps here. So if, we're, if we have 10,000 time iterations, that source will be stored in an array with 10,000 numbers. Let's talk more about the total number of iterations that we need in our simulation. So there's a few considerations we need. Um, we need to consider the device first. One, highly resonant devices require a lot of iterations because the energy gets coupled into them and it just bounces around. They're highly resonant because that energy stays stuck. And so we need to think about that. If it's a purely scattering type of device, just a hunk of metal, a wave hits it and bounces, that really requires much fewer iterations because the energy is not being stuck. It just hits it once and bounces away. And we can really just time it as how far is that distance. Just give it enough time for the wave to hit the device and bounce away. Uh, if there's multiple bounces, we need to let it run a little bit longer. We also need to think about the information that we want to get out of it. If we want to resolve the frequency response very, very finely, that means we need more iterations in time. We can't resolve frequency more finely with a smaller time step. That doesn't do it. What that would do is give us a higher frequency that we can resolve, but the steps in frequency will be unchanged. We just need more iterations to resolve finer steps in frequency. So if we have a device that has a very sharp feature in its spectral response, right away we know we're going to need a lot of iterations. One thing that's neat about finite difference time domain, let's say we have a device that has a very, very narrow resonance. 
Well, we know right away it's going to take a gob of simulations to resolve that resonance. However, what we can do is figure out very precisely where that resonance is in frequency. With a frequency domain model, that's not real easy to do. If we have a very narrow resonance and we've picked too sparse of frequency points to model, we could completely miss a very narrow resonance. However, in a time domain model, we'll see it, we can Fourier transform that data, and we can see where it is. And even after just a few simulations, the more simulations or the more iterations we run, the more finely we can resolve where that resonance is in frequency, but we can pin it down right away. We'll know if it is resonant. Whereas a frequency domain model, we may not even know that something's resonant because we just skip right over it. So here's sort of a rule of thumb or a very quick way we can make a guess as how many iterations it will take to, to run a simulation. The first thing we want to do is calculate how long it takes a wave to propagate just once across our grid. So we take the number of cells times the cell spacing. That product is the physical size of our grid. And we may know that ahead of time. We may not even have to calculate that product. We multiply by the maximum refractive index. That gives us worst case the electrical size of the grid. And then size over speed gives us time. And that'll tell us worst case how long it takes a wave to propagate across our grid. So how long do we want the simulation? Well, if we waited six tau before we introduce our source, we want to wait at least another six tau to let the source go sort of peacefully. So right away, our simulation time needs to be greater than 12 tau. For just sort of moderately scattering devices, maybe there's a little bit of a resonance, we probably want to accommodate five bounces back and forth in our grid. So we'll let five propagation times. So t needs to be greater than that. So what we can do is we can say the total simulation time is 12 taus. That way we ease into our source and ease out of it. And then five, five propagation times. Now for highly resonant devices, we need to allow for many more than five propagation times. We might need hundreds more. But given that propagation time, now we can calculate the steps. We take the propagation time, divide by delta t, the time step size, and then round up, and that'll tell us the total number of steps. Now there's a whole other way of doing this. This is in the context of setting up a for loop that goes 4t from one, two steps. Instead of doing that, let's make it a while loop. And we just keep running and measuring how much power is stuck in our grid and stopping when that power dips below a certain threshold, meaning the, the power in the grid has left either as transmission or reflection, and it's essentially gone. That's a whole other way that we could do a simulation. Okay, so let's pull all of this together now, and let's look at our revised finite difference time domain algorithm. So here it is. The first thing we'll do is calculate grid resolution. So we'll consider the wavelength, we'll consider minimum dimension, we will snap to critical dimensions. Now we're ready to calculate our time step for our boundary conditions. Then we'll calculate our source, which would be a Gaussian source. Then we calculate our update coefficients. Then we'll set all our fields equal to zero. Now we go into this finite difference time domain loop. So it's a big loop over time. And for each time step, we update h from e. We also have a boundary condition in here. After doing the update, we record the boundary term, h3 equals h2, followed by h2 equals h1, followed by h1 equals the h field in the first cell. Remember this update is a loop over all the z components, so we have another for loop in here. This is not a for loop. This is outside of the, the, the main update where we record the boundary term. Then we update e from h. This is another loop over z, and we're using our perfect boundary condition here. Once we're done doing all the updates, we record the E field at the boundary. So E3 equals E2, then E2 equals E1, then E1 equals the electric field at the far boundary. At this point, we can inject the source. We're just doing a simple soft source here. We're not doing our total field scatter field yet. That'll happen next lecture. But we inject the source simply by adding our source to one of the electric field values. Then we probably want to visualize the fields to make movies and stuff like that and we iterate this over time. 
and our fields slowly evolve. And at some point, whether we hit steps or we're checking the power in our grid, we're finished and the simulation's over. Now we're not let learning anything of this. We haven't learned how to do a total field scatter field source. We haven't learned how to calculate transmission and reflection. That's all next lecture. But here's our algorithm now. We still have more to add to this. So in our last slide, we'll show how to go from these equations to MATLAB code. So the first thing is grid resolution. And remember, we have two considerations here. We have the wavelength and the minimum dimension. So min lambda, if lambda is a, an array of wavelengths that we want to simulate over, we take the minimum one, that's the minimum free space wavelength, divide by the maximum refractive index, so that's the minimum wavelength anywhere in our grid, and we want to resolve that with at least 10 points, let's say, so n res here would be set to 10. Then we want to consider the minimum feature size. We want to resolve that with at least one to four cells, so n d res would be a number like one to four. And we pick the smallest one of those. That's our first guess at DZ, or the grid resolution. Then we want to snap the grid to the critical dimensions. So we pick some dimension that we really, really want to get right, DC. We divide that by the grid cell size. That tells us how many cells wide that critical dimension is. And we want this to be an integer, but it probably isn't yet. So we'll round up to an integer. That will be N now. And so we adjust DZ so that we can resolve this critical dimension with an exact number of, of cells, integer number of cells. Then let's look at our update equations. We have these update equations using our perfect boundaries. So this first step here inside the time loop, this first step is updating H from E. So we have our update equation that we've seen before, but after that we're going to record the H field at the boundary. H3 equals H2, H2 equals H1, H1 equals HX at the first cell. That ensures H3 is HX at the first cell just two time steps ago. Likewise, we update E from H. So here's our basic updates for that. And then we're doing the same basic thing, recording the electric field at the last cell. And then this term ends up being used up here for the boundary condition. And this term H3 is used down here as the boundary condition. So that's it for this lecture. Next time we'll talk about total field scatter field and calculating transmission and reflection from a device. At that point, we will have a complete one-dimensional finite difference time domain code that has a reasonable degree of sophistication.